If you listen closely, you can almost imagine the voices of history echoing off of these walls. They reiterate the Western lore of the saga of Fort Laramie. The saga begins in the early years of the 1800s. Thomas Jefferson was president. Lewis and Clark had just returned from their epic exploration. They brought back evidence of a land rich in animals and furs. Millions of dollars were swimming in and damming up the streams of the Rocky Mountains. All anyone had to do was go there and harvest them. The French-Canadian trappers were already there. They had swarmed out of the north, exploring and trapping the virgin streams of the west. But on paper, those streams were now American, and Americans were quick to seize the opportunity. Beaver furs became big business, and its capital, St. Louis. January 18th, 1823, the subscribers wish to engage 100 men to ascend the Missouri to the Rocky Mountains, there to be employed as hunters. Next thing that happened was Grattan, Grattan ordered his, his men to fire. Killing the main chief that they were talking to, wounding several others, and the entire village uh, quickly dispatched the soldiers. One managed to crawl back to the post that evening with the tail and tell it shortly before he died and communication was slow and hand-to-hand. -hand. By the time this story reached Washington, it was a story of an, an unprovoked attack by Indians on an unarmed group of soldiers. August 29, 1854. We have been kept in a terrible state of suspense by reports of these bloodhounds and red devils charging the fort. All feeling of security is now destroyed. Nor will it be restored until the Indians get a good drubbing from the government. Captain Lewis B. Doherty, Fort Laramie, Oregon Territory. That drubbing came the next year. The U.S. Army attacked a band of Sioux at the Blue Water on further down river in what is now Nebraska. The troops were commanded by William S. Harney. Brilliant battlefield commander Harney was. He was a general's general. He located an Indian camp. He attacked the camp, surprising it in the morning, devastated the camp. September 5th, 1855. We attacked them with our rifles while their arrows, or the bullets from their poor flintlocks, could not reach us. They were forced to flee, but they ran straight into the arms of our dragoons, who followed them as they turned back to us. Eugene Bandle. He would find out later it was the wrong camp of Indians that he had attacked. An uneasy peace followed, and now it became the Army's job to patrol the trails. But there were too many trails and not enough soldiers, and the small skirmishes maintained an uneasy tension throughout the next decade. The Bozeman Trail, blazed by John Bozeman, was the quickest way to that gold. Wagon trains full of miners creaked along the trail through the heart of the Lakota Reservation. The gold reserves were almost completely exhausted because of the war. Money was on the gold standard, and gold discoveries became precious. The government says to the Army, don't worry about it, the treaty was never ratified, it's perfectly legal. The tribes saw it very differently. The Lakota reacted like angry hornets from a jostled nest. Their attacks brought travel to a standstill. The Army built Fort Reno, Fort Phil Kearney, and Fort C.F. Smith to force the Bozeman Trail open. Fort Phil Kearney was the center of the hornet's nest and received most of the Lakota's attention. 
The biggest conflict would come on December 21st, 1866. On that day, a small detail of soldiers were outside the fort cutting wood. A small band of Indians attacked the wood train. Captain Fetterman rode out of the fort to their rescue. He reached the woodcutters, then, disobeying orders, he followed the retreating Sioux and led his command over Lodgepole Ridge and into an ambush. It was here that the final part of the battle took place. Captain William J. Fetterman and all 80 men under his command were wiped out. Those that remained at the greatly undermanned fort were filled with dread. A scout, John Portuguese Phillips, volunteered to ride to Fort Laramie for reinforcements. Phillips left in sub-zero weather and rode through a snowstorm to arrive at Old Bedlam on Christmas Eve. He had ridden the 235 miles through hostile Indian country in four days. Reinforcements were sent, but less than a year later, the forts were abandoned and the Bozeman Trail closed. In 1868, a treaty conference was held here to end a war that was sparked because of the Bozeman Trail, known as Red Cloud's War. It was a war that the Army was losing very, very seriously to the tribes. And it was becoming a political embarrassment for the government and a military embarrassment for the Army. The 1868 treaty, unlike the 51 treaty, was ratified by Congress. It was made into law. Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and others wanted nothing to do other than return to the former, former glory of the Sioux Nation. And that wasn't going to happen, unfortunately. the Pony Express arrived. Now, Fort Laramie received news from the east in only three days. Then, in 1861, the telegraph arrived, making Fort Laramie just a keystroke away from the rest of the world. Fort Laramie grew from a small trading post to arguably the most important military post in the west. It had outlived the ages of the beaver, the buffalo, and the nomadic Indian, all who gave purpose to its existence. Through the years, some buildings have crumbled into history's dust. The sounds of the living have changed. And I look down there, he's ready. I go, ready? He pulls back on that hammer, aim, fire. The bugle call has faded its purpose vanished to the past. The river has lost its depth and rage, but land remains largely unchanged, and the same Wyoming wind howls through the juniper and sage. The sun still reaches with evening fingers toward the buildings that remain. And the trees protected from the seekers of fuel reach new heights. It is a place where in an age not so long ago, men and women of history lived uncommon lives in extraordinary times. Inside this building and here on these steps, you're gonna see gentlemen sitting like Jim Bridger, Kit Carson. You're gonna run into uh, Chief Red Cloud, Chief Spotted Tail. You're going to see Buffalo Bill, Wyatt Earp, Calamity Jane. You're going to see General Sherman, General Sheridan, General Crook. Literally almost anyone you can mention in the West, excluding Custer, come into this store. And amongst the skeletons of what once was, the echoes of history drift, waiting to be heard by those who will listen. <laughs> 